To be born in the countryside in the mid-20th century meant growing up in an old world. The little had changed from the way of life that existed a hundred years before. Horses were still the most commonly used forms of transport and draft power on narrow winding byways, on sloping fields and in wooded ravines. My winter memories are of water vapor rising from their breath and their warm flanks. My image of summer is filled with the scent of their brown hair and glossy manes. For farmers who still lived off the land, the stables were one of the smaller but nobler parts of the enterprise. Cattle, pigs and chickens were more omnipresent, more pungent. The horses, in contrast, were rare, precious and sweet-smelling. Standing in their stables like living sculptures, they would nod their shapely heads, signalling distrust or suspicion with a twitch of their ears. No farmer would consider surrounding his horse's meadow with the barbed wire, which was often used to enclose sheep and cattle. For the horses, a bit of wood or electric fence was sufficient to stop them escaping. One does not incarcerate aristocrats. It is enough to remind them of their word of honour. I picture myself and my grandfather, one day in the mid-1950s, standing on a hill from where we could see our farm and the surrounding land. The silence had been ripped apart by something that resembled a hunchbacked ant, slowly and noisily heaving itself up the hill. As it approached, this gigantic ant revealed itself to be one of my uncle's ancient Mercedes diesel tractors. My grandfather made a disparaging remark about it and watched with growing skepticism as my cousin, at the helm of this beast, turned off the hard track and headed across the paddock straight towards us. After just a few meters on the damp grass, he lost control and the tractor jolted sideways, skidded and made a dive for the electric fence where it became entangled and finally came to a halt by a tree stump in a cloud of dark blue smoke. After all the attempts by the driver to extricate the vehicle had failed, a heavy Belgian draft horse came to the rescue. Hitched up to the diesel's rear bumper, this good-natured giant heaved the wrecked vehicle back onto solid ground. Everyone knows the Turner painting of a steam tug puffing away as it tows a proud warship, the fighting Temeraire, sails furled to her final resting place in the shipbreaking yard. Here, it was the horse, history's retired war veteran, who was called on to tow the diesel engine. The old world was back in the harness, slogging away in the service of the new. The end of the horse age fits almost exactly with what has tended to be called the long 19th century, the period starting with Napoleon and ending with the First World War. Since then, virtually every kind of technology for which horses traditionally provided the necessary traction power, from the transport sector to the military, has switched over to combustion engines or electric motors. In practice, this changeover was a considerably drawn-out process. Now, though, the separation of man and horse is not only a done deal, it is also a finished process. At the beginning of the era of the horse, there is a paradox, as it were, the paradox of the entire history. An intelligent mammal, man, asserts his power over another mammal, the horse. We domesticate and breed horses, befriend them and use them for our own ends. The astonishing thing is that the whole process still functions even though mankind's end goals run contrary to the nature of his four-legged colleague. Unlike man, the horse is by nature a prey animal which flees at the slightest hint of danger. When it is not competing with peers for sexual purposes, it has no need of confrontation or quarrels, the instinct to seek out prey is quite unknown to the great vegetarian. It is the horse's speed when it needs to flee that allows it to escape the threat of hunters and carnivores. This is precisely the characteristic that attracted the attention of another mammal, the human. Had it been restricted to the role of pack animal, it would have languished with the ox and the ass in the backyard of history, lurking by the tradesman's entrance. It was only as a swift animal of flight that the horse took its place at the forefront of the symbiosis of history and nature, the top spot to which, for all the historical success of the camel and the elephant, 
the horse could assert its right unchallenged for 6,000 years. To be fast meant being mounted, a unique historical discovery which is now largely forgotten. Thanks to the horse, distant territories could be conquered and vast dominions established and maintained. The horse paved the way, historically speaking, for a new kind of power politics, the politics of conquest. Compared with this historic alliance, every other covenant into which mankind has entered within his history has been fragile and ephemeral. Not even man's relationship with his gods has shown a comparable degree of stability. All the more remarkable, then, is its sudden breakup. At the very moment that the alliance had reached its strongest and most intense bond, it began to fall into inexorable ruin. While one party to the treaty, the human side of the old alliance, entered into all manner of short-lived alliances with various kinds of machinery, automobiles, aircraft and computers, the other party, the horse, went into semi-retirement with a part-time job as a recreational item, a mode of therapy, a status symbol and a source of pastoral support for female puberty. Henceforth, horses would be granted only fleeting appearances in their archaic role as inspirer of terror, when required to intimidate picketing workers or drive rallies of protesters out of shopping precincts. There are still places in Europe where we get a sense of how a horse-filled city must have looked and smelled. In Vienna and Rome, there are squares where carriages and dozing horses wait for tourists. But can we imagine how a 19th century city would have sounded? Who can conjure up the cracking whips, the wagon wheels and horseshoes on the cobbles in the early morning hours when sleep is fragile and ephemeral? Arthur Schopenhauer denounced the cracking of whips as the most irresponsible and shameful din, which breaks the concentration of one who labours with his mind. This sudden, sharp thwack, which slices through one's brain and shatters one's thoughts, must strike agony into every man who carries anything so much as resembling a thought in his head. The clamour of horses, carriages and coaches sets the pulse of the trembling city. In Louis Sebastian Mercier's Tableau de Paris, from 1781, the author describes how, at every hour of the day, the noise of the city subtly changes. The worst is the racket at about five o'clock in the afternoon, when everyone is driving towards each other, pushing to get past, clogging up the roads. At seven o'clock in the evening, the noise fades out. The city becomes still. The workers go home on foot, but by nine the clamour rises anew as the bourgeoisie head out to the theatre. Around midnight, silence reigns again, broken only by the occasional rumble of the cabs bringing city dwellers home. At one o'clock in the morning, 6,000 farmers descend upon the city laden with vegetables, fruit and flowers. By two o'clock, the gigs and coaches of those returning late to their beds tear Parisians from their sleep. On the 18th of January, 1766, a dispute arose at the edge of the Place de Victoire between a cab driver and an elegant aristocrat, the consequences of which were investigated by the police and registered in the archives. A driver stopped to let out his customer. On seeing that he and his own carriage were thus prevented from moving forward, the aristocratic gentleman flared up in anger and stepping down from his carriage, beat the horse with his sword and stabbed it in the abdomen. He was eventually made to pay the cab driver for the care of the injured horse. The signature on the ensuing legal document was that of an irascible character whose name went down in history as a byword for cruelty, Marquis de Sade. As early as the mid-18th century, Paris was the horse capital. Nearly 80,000 horses populated the city at the height of the horse era in 1880. By 1789, on the eve of the revolution, almost two million horses grazed the pastures of France. By 1850, their number had increased to nearly three million, a level which remained consistent with only slight fluctuations until the First World War. <laughs> 
Of course, the human population also rose from 36.5 million in 1852 to 41 million in 1906. But the ratio of one species to another, of horses to men, changed by only one percentage point. Even then, every 13th Frenchman was a horse. Yet France was by no means in first place in terms of national horse populations. In the UK, in the 19th century, there was one horse for every ten residents. While in the USA, the ratio was one to four, and in Australia, it was one to two. In the late 19th century, there were 300,000 horses living in London. Even where the ratio was only 26.4 inhabitants per horse, as in New York in 1900, the absolute numbers are still staggering. Imagine what life must have been like in Manhattan when there were some 130,000 horses working in the city. How must a city like New York in 1900 have reeked when its horses produced 1,100 tons of manure and 270,000 litres of urine daily and when 20 dead horses were transported away every day? The figures are even higher for the considerably larger city of London, at the Knacker's Yard, 26,000 horses per year were turned into cat food and fertilizer. Photographs from those early times convey only a pale reflection of the cramped coexistence humans and horses had to endure in the city at the fin de siècle. For the horses living in the 19th century city, seized by the storm of mechanization, it was no healthy environment. Their muscles, tendons, hooves and joints could only endure the harsh work providing draft power for the urban modes of transport for a few years before they were sold on for commercial use to pull lighter loads or allowed to return for their final years to the countryside. City horses went into retirement at the age of five and had an average lifespan of ten years. This was true of omnibus horses, while tram horses tended to be exhausted after four years. For many, the end came even sooner, by way of permanent lameness. A sad fate concluded with the veterinarian's bullet. Between 1887 and 1897, the employees of New York's ASPCA, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, put down between 1,800 and 7,000 horses annually. Contrary to the popular notion, the dead animal was not left to rot in the gutter. The disposal of carcasses was a mechanized process, a winch powered by horsepower, hauled it onto a cart, a tarpaulin was thrown over it, and it was transported out of the city. A small town in Westphalia was dominated from the late 50s by two rival gangs. One was called the Forest Gang, the other the Village Gang. Both recruited boys who had recently turned 10. The good boys went to high school, the bad ones joined the gangs, and then there were a few who did both. The gangs were basic social structures with a vague hierarchy. That is to say, there was a chief but the others did more or less what they wanted. In contrast to this weak organizational structure stood the strong traditions of the initiation ritual. I can't comment precisely on the initiation ritual for the forest gang, but I can vouch for the village gang's rites of passage. The underlings were subjected to a test of courage before being admitted to the illustrious club, and it clearly drew upon the old way of life. In front of their assembled peers, the new boys were made to eat a local delicacy, a prominent agricultural product found in great abundance in the country, a ball of horse dung. This was common practice until 1960, at any rate. Ten years later, the supply of horse dung had dried up. The producers had vanished. The era of the horse was already over, so it was no coincidence that the consumption of their byproduct, the horse apple, came to an abrupt end. In 
Of course, since 1960, there have still been horses in Germany. Since 1970, their number has even been on the increase again, when the horse began its new career as the plaything and soulmate of the pubescent girl. But the Pony Club is an enclave on the margins of the real world. The year 1960 was also the one in which the television set conquered the living room, a pony club for the armchair rider, bringing magical horses into the homes of viewers, from Fury and Bonanza to Mr. Ed, the talking horse. It was the dawn of a new world of equestrianism and a new experience of nature beyond the village and the forest. Of the previous partnership of man and horse, only the human half remained. The other half, the horse, was subsumed into the secondary reality of the media. It had become a cultural icon. The tangible lack of horse dung since 1960 caused difficulties not only for the traditionally-minded section of the village youth, it was also tough on some much smaller creatures. The sparrows. For as long as there were horses, there were also sparrows, whether it was in the countryside or in the city, living in the lap of luxury. Horse dropping still contained a considerable quantity of leftovers of the horse's favourite food, oats. At any rate, what remained was more than adequate for a sparrow's appetite. This is due to the nature of the oat grain, which is more robustly packaged by the surrounding husk than the grains of other cereals. In the eyes of sparrows, blessed God took the form of a horse. The end was all the more tragic then for them. The twilight of the equine gods also meant the disappearance of one of the main food supplies for the European sparrow. Paris, the capital city of the 19th century, was also the capital of traffic. It was little wonder that there were so many accidents. Louis Sebastien Mercier was present at one of the earliest recorded urban pileups. I witnessed the disaster on the 28th of May, 1770. Its cause was a mass of vehicles blocking the road, across which poured the most enormous stream of people, a huge crowd in the dim light of the boulevards. By a hair's breadth, I avoided losing my life. Twelve to fifteen people were killed, either on the spot or later as a consequence of their injuries, having been crushed so terribly. Three times I was hurled to the ground, each time by a different coach, and I was almost crushed alive under the wheels of one. Throughout the 19th century, the number of accidents in the cities and on the highways rose steadily, caused by bolting horses, overturning carriages, collisions, and driving at excessive speeds. Even at the beginning of the 20th century, when automobiles were beginning to be found on the streets, the cause of traffic accidents was still overwhelmingly the use and abuse of horses. 53% of accidents registered in France in 1903 involved horse-drawn carriages, one-third in the cities, two-thirds on the country roads. Figures for the United States around the turn of the century come out at an annual average of 750,000 accidents and serious injuries. The literature of the 19th century is full of lamentation about reckless drivers, drunken coachmen, toppling carriages, injured passers-by, and terror-stricken travellers. It is not the dreaded highwayman who is the traveller's worst enemy, but his best friend, the horse. Horses are flight animals, easily startled and quick to resort to their instinctive flight reflex. A sudden movement in their peripheral vision, the bark of a dog, a sheet of newspaper caught by the wind, and that's it. Before you know it, the horse loses its head and bolts. A bolting horse can have fatal consequences, especially in the crush of the city, and if other horses are also alarmed. Urban workhorses need to become accustomed to the traffic and the sights and sounds of the city. Just as in a military context, war horses need to become attuned to gunfire and cannons. But not only did the industry need horses to be bred and trained in a certain way, the men working in this new environment also had to adjust to the increasingly complex and fast-moving traffic conditions. The drunken cabbie was no longer merely a nuisance, 
he had become a risk factor. Efforts to regulate the speed of horse traffic go back as far as the Renaissance. In a decree of 1539, Francis I of France spoke for the first time of the dangers of speeding, overtaking, and turning abruptly in the streets of the cities and on the highways of the kingdom. Yet it was not until the end of the 17th century that the first steps were taken by police forces to confront excessive speeding and careless driving. It was around 1780 that a new invention started to appear on the streets in England and France, which in a seamless solution to both social and technical challenges was able to protect urban pedestrians and implement a physical division of the road by creating different levels. What we are talking about is, of course, the trottoir, or pavement, a clearly delineated, elevated walkway whose curbstone forms a physical border between the carriageway of moving vehicles and the dedicated space for pedestrians. The tens of thousands of horses living and working in the cities needed not only to be fed and watered, they also required accommodation. On a scale that is barely imaginable now, the 19th century city consisted of rows upon rows of urban stables, whose often haphazard construction out of wood and brick made them a liability in terms of both sanitary conditions and fire safety. Boston, in 1867, boasted some 367 stables, each housing an average of 7.8 horses. These stable blocks were dotted across the entire city. Just like the coach houses still to be found today in the yards of European townhouses or the Mews Lanes of London, the stables were mostly located behind the houses or accommodated in the central courtyard of a block of dwellings. Most had one or possibly two storeys, though in some cases three- or four-storey stables were built. In the largest London bus depot on Farm Lane, Fulham, 700 horses were accommodated on two floors around a huge square courtyard. Doctors, travelling by horseback or by carriage, would often be called out to accidents involving other riders or coachmen. Horses are jumpy animals, easily spooked and quick to yield to their natural flight reflex. Once one bolts, it is no easy matter to catch it and calm it down again. But it is not the horse in isolation that made travel so risky before the age of mechanized transport. Other factors played a part. Bad roads, bad weather, darkness, the laziness and drunkenness of the driver. Finally, the carriage itself... If the brakes are not applied properly, the carriage wobbles and overturns, and once it's landed in the mud, it's as good as stuck. The accident caused by bolting horses and an overturned shattered carriage is a subject of travel literature since its beginnings in the Renaissance. Especially popular were the accounts of grisly accidents and miraculous escapes which filled 18th century almanacs. One example is the breathtaking description in the 1799 edition of the Handbook for Horse Lovers, Riders, Breeders, Veterinary Surgeons and Supervisors of Large Stables. An Englishman by the name of Luthbrett Lambert of Newcastle was riding over Stamford Stone Bridge, when upon this bridge he wished to make an about turn, causing his horse to come to a halt so abruptly that the swift and sensitive horse suddenly reared up into the air and the very next moment leaped over the railing of the bridge into the river below. A low-lying branch of an ash tree, hanging with good fortune so close to the bridge, saved this rider from death, who clung firmly to this same branch and remained hanging there until some passers-by delivered him from this uncomfortable and indeed fearsome position. The horse, which plummeted with all its might onto the riverbed some twenty foot below, lay in the place where it had died. In addition to the literary archives, we also have a long history of chronicling horse riders coming a cropper in illustrated form, with the most recent and most spectacular additions to the genre available on YouTube. The historical context of these pictures and videos constitutes a sort of European image gallery of every conceivable kind of accident involving a horse, a carriage or a wagon. A frantic horse bolting with a carriage still attached, the coachman under the wheel. 
two draft horses that have jumped over a wall, smashing the wagon and injuring the driver. A carriage with its driver fallen into a ravine, the horse standing at the edge of the cliff. A collision between a horse-drawn cart and a motorcycle. The driver is on the ground. The injured horse is on its knees. In 1756, a French handbook for stable masters presented the allegedly untippable Berlin model. Johann Popper's History of Inventions focuses on efforts to improve vehicle safety, higher wheels, broader axles, greater agility, and solidity of the parts. Any industrious cartwright can improve a carriage, but how does one improve the nature of a draft animal? How does one help a horse to keep its nerve? Or if it loses it and bolts, how does one bring it to a halt? Popper's history of inventions is systematic in its approach and distinguishes between three procedures that might prevent horses from bolting or mitigate the consequences when they do. These are 1. A full braking system 2. The separation of the horses from the carriage 3. Rapidly covering the eyes of the frenzied beasts A residual risk remains, of course, in every event. After all, you can't simply switch off an oat-powered engine. For those digging for the roots of the association between man and horse, not as consumable livestock, but as a load-drawing and carrying work animal, then we need to look for teeth marks. With the help of radiocarbon dating, Horse bones found first in Ukraine and then in northern Kazakhstan, both Copper Age settlements, could be dated to the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 3rd millennium. But the bones said nothing about the purpose of these animal populations. No answer to the crucial question, calories or kinetics. However, beside the bones at both sites, snaffle bits were found carved from stag's antlers. These suggested that the horses were not intended exclusively for consumption, but were either used for riding with bridles or as draft animals. Archaeology was able to go a step further. Whatever kind of bit had been used, it had left marks and signs of wear on the tooth enamel of a horse. This evidence enabled the earliest use of the horse as a draft animal or mount to be dated to 4,200 to 3,700 BCE. This is also supported by the herding of domesticated animals, for which there is also evidence dating to this period. While it's possible to herd cattle and sheep on foot, in the long term this is impossible with horses. In order to keep horses permanently in herds, the herdsman needs to be mounted. No text, no picture, and no material evidence testifies to the courage of the man who first mounted a wild horse and coaxed it into tolerating its rider and obeying his will. The moment when man began, through domestication and breeding, to connect his fate with the horse may have been the narrow gate through which man entered the realm of history. With the horse... Man not only had a particularly fast and agile companion whose strength, endurance and speed gave him new, unheard-of means to wage war, the horse was also a comparatively undemanding and robust partner that was almost as adaptable as man himself. This is particularly the case with respect to the horse's nutritional needs and digestive system. Horses feed on grass that no cattle would be able to eat, its cellulose structure is too tough, and because of its low protein content, it offers insufficient nutrition for cows. Moreover, ruminants such as cows need long rest periods to chew the cud, while a horse with its simple stomach can digest as it carries on walking. But the primary precondition for the horse's resilience and frugal nutritional needs is, of course, its pearly whites. Thanks to their hard crown teeth, horses can graze on and break down the tough grass of the prairies, steppes, and savannah. The horse, writes Jürgen Oesterhammel in the context of the 19th century North American Wild West, functioned as an energy transformer 
converting the energy stored in grassland into muscle power obedient to human command. In the white imagination, the Native American Indians are horse riders. It's hard to picture them without their horses. Like their legendary counterparts, the cowboys, the popular perception of the Red Indians is of them fused with their horses in a thoroughly equestrian existence. The Western, that epic genre that sings of the glorious deeds of cowboys and Indians, is a cloak-and-dagger fiction of the movie era, where the colt is the weapon instead of the dagger. The ubiquity of this image makes it all the more astonishing when we learn that the horse-riding Indians were in fact latecomers in the history of the native Indian tribes, and the use and cultivation of horses was far from typical of all the tribes of North America. On the contrary, the eastern woodland Indians, also the tribes of the Midwest and the South, did not have horses, and neither did they adopt them later on as other tribes did. They hunted on foot and trod the warpath as infantry. Even the tribes who did at some point discover horses and learn to use them did not by themselves become wild horseback warriors. Only a small part of the total tribal population learned to fight on horseback. For about 10,000 years, from the end of the Pleistocene Epoch, America was a continent without horses. The loss of many species of American megafauna, including mammoths, camels and lions, as well as horses from the American mainland, is today thought to have been caused primarily by changes to the climate and vegetation. Whatever the reason, America was a continent without horses when the Spanish conquistadors introduced them at the end of the 15th century. The Spaniards were skillful importers. It was not just a first-class product they were importing in the form of the Ibero-Arabian horse. They also possessed a considerable amount of associated knowledge. They came from the most highly developed equestrian civilization of the Western world. The Moors, who dominated the Iberian Peninsula from the early 8th century CE, transformed their adopted home into a second riding school. They crossed the fast, tough Spanish horses with the purebreds they brought with them, thereby improving the Iberian breeds which had long been considered the best in Europe. The transfer of the Arabian or Moorish culture to the Christian inhabitants of the Iberian Peninsula was in large part the work of learned and skilled Jews. What is less well known is that Jews also played a decisive role in the translation of Spanish equine knowledge into the technological culture of indigenous North America. Not just the first ranchers of the New World, they were also the first cowboys in America. The Jewish conquistadors who came to Mexico in 1519 with Hernán Cortés, led by Hernando Alonso, were emigrants fleeing the Inquisition which was nevertheless still hot on their heels on the other side of the ocean, Alonso was burnt alive on the 17th of October, 1528. They understood cattle and horse breeding, and in order to survive in the new world unseen by the Inquisition, they became ranchers and moved northwards in the wake of the gradual Spanish expansion towards Nueva España, present-day New Mexico. These Jews were the first to bring the Hineta riding style, where the rider has short stirrup straps and appears to float above the horse, the high-horned Persian saddle, and the Andalusian ancestor of the quarter horse to the deserts of the southwest. They did it in their particular way, as Jewish ranchers. The horses had a hard time of it with their new mission. First of all, very few even survived the passage by sea. The windless zones between the trade winds and the westerly winds were called the horse latitudes because of the countless horses that perished in the heat and were thrown overboard. If they did survive the journey, many died shortly after reaching the hot and humid climate on the islands off the coast of Mexico. Their situation improved when the Spaniards continued to penetrate towards the north and the animals were able to acclimatize. Between 1530 and 1550, there was the first explosive increase in the population of horses in North America. With Juan de Oñate 
the first large herd of horses reached New Mexico in 1598. The Spaniards had little trouble initially with the Pueblo Indians, who learned to look after the Spanish horses without showing any particular interest in them. This was not the case with the Apaches, who lived in the same region. They stole the Spanish horses and learned to ride by imitating the incomers. From the middle of the century, according to Spanish sources, the new Indian riders made life difficult for their former teachers. They attacked their settlements in New Mexico, not even sparing the Pueblo Indian communities, stole their horses and disappeared in the vastness of the prairies. Unlike the later Comanche, the Apaches never learned how to breed horses or to fight on horseback. But they were the first American Indians to undergo a major technological revolution and enrich their arsenal with a weapon that at that point no other indigenous tribe had mastered. Speed. The revolt of the Pueblos against the Spaniards in 1680 and their temporary expulsion from New Mexico brought a turning point for the horse culture of North America. When the Pueblo Indians returned to their agriculture, they abandoned the horses they had traveled with, and a mighty river of horses spilled into the prairies of the Midwest. Within a comparatively short time, their population had soared, producing the large herds of wild mustangs which were seized upon by about 30 tribes of the Great Plains. The so-called Great Horse Dispersal from 1680 resulted in a permanent change to the power structures of North America's geographical center. The process was rapid. In 1630, no native tribe had ever sat on a horse while by around 1700, all the tribes on the plains of Texas were riding horses. It was not a huge step then from hunting technique to military tactic. A number of tribes took horses into battle at some point, with the Comanche the most thorough and successful. The only Indian tribe to truly master the art of breeding and raising horses, the Comanche, linked their fate and their economy closely with the life of an animal that until a few decades before had been unknown to them. In the 1820s and 1830s, thanks to their military superiority, they posed a considerable threat to the stream of American colonialists flowing into Texas. Even the Texas Rangers, a militia launched by Stephen F. Austin in 1823 to protect the settlers, needed over 20 years before it was ready to take on the wild hegemony of the prairie. Their old breed cavalry horses were cumbersome, clumsy, and too quickly exhausted to keep up with the Indians' swift, tough mustangs or ponies. Their weapons consisted of single-shot pistols and long-barreled rifles of little use in combat with an enemy who could shoot up to 20 arrows per minute while riding at full pelt. Out in the open, with no palisade to take cover behind, the Texas Rangers were hopelessly inferior to the Comanche, the average life expectancy of a ranger was two years. The turning point came in 1840, when Jack Hayes, a firebrand of 23, assumed command of the ranger's garrison in San Antonio. Hayes provided his unit with new, lighter horses, crossbreeds of mustangs and thoroughbreds. He taught his men to live like Indians, always alert and ready to fight, Hay's men shot and loaded their weapons faster than any other and in the saddle, which at this time no other white militia or cavalry could manage, even in battle. It was only in firing speed and firepower that they lagged behind their Indian teachers. The rangers would achieve a similar status when they had in their hands the invention of a young, technically gifted Yankee. From 1843... Armed with Samuel Colt's five-shot, later six-shot revolver, Jack Hayes's Texan militia finally had the perfect weapon for firing on the move and in quick succession. While the six-shot reduced the risky time it took to charge the weapon, it also shifted active warfare into the saddle once and for all. <laughs> ¶¶ 
The outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853 brought an end to an almost 40-year period of peace in Europe. For a very long time, horses and riders had been masters of the battlefield. Under Napoleon, the cavalry had risen to become the most visible and in many cases decisive weapon of battle. The cavalry was the section capable of the fastest motion, the wedge which at the height of the struggle broke the resistance of the hostile masses. The cavalry was the shimmering weapon, a large, colorful, many-limbed being, and at the same time it was a monument to its own brilliance and ebullience. But the new wars from the mid-19th century on saw the start of its long, slow fall from grace. After the end of the American Civil War, it took Europe three quarters of a century to understand the lessons that America had learned in four bloody years. Nations and armies do not draw lessons from observing far-off disasters. They learn, if at all, from their own crushing defeats. But what lessons could the European staff officers and cavalrymen have drawn from the battles of the Civil War? What was apparent first of all was the rapid slump in value of the cavalry as an offensive weapon in comparison with the infantry's breech loaders and repeating firearms. Secondly, less obviously, was the capacity of the cavalry beyond the classical battlefield role. For example, commando operations aimed at interrupting enemy supply lines. On both sides, riders made extensive tactical use of these swift, flexible operations. Furthermore, observers of the Civil War would have been able to study the benefits of modifications to the cavalry's armory. If the main purpose of the cavalry was to sabotage the railways behind the enemy line or to stand up to mounted guerrilla fighters, then the tactics, arms and equipment all had to change. This was precisely what happened in America. While the European armies still clung to using conventional weaponry such as sabers and spears... Here we enter the era of the final battles. From the days of the Franco-Prussian War, historians have never tired of declaring the new final cavalry battle. At the end of the day, the stage needed to be cleared for the cruel spectacle of the First World War. If you were going to ride into the line of fire now, you had to be insane, a general, suicidal, or all three at once. The only European nation that showed signs of revising its cavalry tactics before the First World War was Britain. The British had not learned from the American Civil War, but from the unrest in the colonies and from the guerrilla war that the Boers had forced upon them. The war against the Boers, which broke out in October 1899, quickly spiralled from a conventional confrontation into a guerrilla war where horses played a pivotal role. After the Boers realized they were inferior to the British in pitched battles, they focused instead on surprise attacks by smaller commando troops on tough African ponies. Lord Kitchener, commander-in-chief, responded with a series of measures aimed at limiting the movement of the Boers, while at the same time increasing that of the British troops. Its most important element was the increased deployment of mounted troops, which at the height of the war in 1901 constituted almost a third of the entire expeditionary force of 250,000 men. Both the American Indian Wars and the Boer War showed that the contemporary military value of the cavalry lay in the combination of firepower and mobility. But this evidence was paid little heed in the strategic and tactical thinking of military leaders entering the First World War. Even the British Army remained deaf to the voice of experience. Douglas Haig, commander-in-chief on the Western Front from December 1915 to the end of the war, had taken part in the Boer War. But as an avowed cavalryman, he wore his spurs even in his headquarters. He rejected the impact of modern weaponry. Douglas Haig, or Butcher Haig as he was known from July 1916 after the Battles of the Somme, even maintained as late as 1927, an entire decade after the end of the Great War, that aeroplanes and tanks were mere accessories to a man on horseback. One of the reasons why the cavalry was prone to this malady of conservatism was the deep-rooted connection it had with the aristocracy – 
The close connection of man mounted on his steed has an aura of inherent nobility to it. It is imbued with an air of mystical faith, a kind of fetish for the dyad of man and beast. But it is also a striking embodiment of an age-old aristocratic bearing, an attitude or pose that suggests distance and superiority. A horse grants his rider power at any moment to create a spatial distance between the rider and the lowly men on foot, his pedestrian entourage. In the collective memory of Europeans, the image of a rider atop his horse, an image which cavalrymen such as Haig consciously evoked, embodies an eternal paradigm of chivalry every armed horseman reminds us of St. George. The battlefields of the First World War were an environment dominated by new technology, where the chances of mounted troops carrying out their operations successfully were radically decreased. This was not just because of the increased firepower of the machine gun. Since the late 19th century, another technical enemy had emerged to threaten the cavalry. It was as dangerous as it was unimpressive. A simple stretch of iron wire. It didn't even need to be the infamous barbed wire of the First World War. The straightforward iron fence found around fields on a farm served to hold the animals back. The historian, Reviel Netz, argues convincingly that the changes in land use in the second half of the 19th century meant that ever greater areas of open country, which the cavalry needed for confrontations, were cut off by enclosures and fences. Even if a few farmers pulled down their fences, there was still little space for the cavalry to pick up speed. The minute-long run before they reached another fence was not enough for a classic attack. By contrast, the horse's attraction engine experienced a sinister boom. The logistical complexities of the massive armies and the expansion and improvement of medical services increased the number of horses in use and with it the challenge of replenishing stocks. The reason for the high demand for draft horses was not least the increase in the number and weight of heavy weapons. It was not an infrequent sight to see teams of 12 or more horses dragging their heavy load along rain-sodden roads towards the artillery positions, an arduous and treacherous procession. Neither did chemical warfare, launched in 1915, spare the lives of horses. They were also helpless in the face of attack by enemy aircraft. Horses could not duck for cover. That's why it was seen by pilots as more effective to bomb horse-drawn convoys than marching columns. The animals were easier to target and harder to replace than men. By the final climax of the fighting on the Western Front in August 1918, the life expectancy of an artillery horse was ten days. The number of horses deployed by all parties in the First World War is currently estimated at 16 million, of which half the total met their death before the end of the war. This figure stands alongside an estimated 9 million people killed by the war. The fate that awaited horses during the Second World War was hardly any gentler. At the beginning of the Second World War, writes historian Heinz Mayer, an infantry division possessed more than twice as many horses as an equivalent division in the First World War. The greater number of heavy weapons necessitated this increase in the supply of horses. In the non-motorized troops in the First World War, there was one horse for every seven men. In the Second World War, it was more like one horse for every four soldiers. A Polish child experiencing the war is taken aback by the sight of the masses of dead horses. In his childhood memoirs, Richard Kapuscinski writes, The air was thick with the smell of gunpowder, fire, rotting flesh. Again and again we stumble across the carcasses of horses. This large, defenseless animal, the horse, it cannot hide. It stands there frozen when the bombs fall, stands there and waits for death. At every step we see dead horses, here in the middle of the road, there at the roadside in a ditch, again a little further away in a field. There they lie, with stiff legs stretched up to heaven, shaking their hooves at the world. I don't see dead people anywhere, because they are buried straight away, 
Just everywhere I look, I see the carcasses of horses. Blacks, bays, piebalds, pintos, chestnuts. It's as if this weren't a war of the people, but of horses. As though it were these animals who were fighting a battle of life and death. As though they were the only victims of the war. One of the most resilient myths of the last century is the story of the attack by Polish lancers against German tanks on the first day of the Second World War. On the evening of the first day of the German invasion of Poland, 1st of September, 1939, legend has it that a detachment of the Polish cavalry attacked a German panzer division, with courage stirred up by despair at the foreseeable deadly consequences. The actual sequence of events in this unequal encounter was somewhat different. It was a random collision of a Polish cavalry unit with German tank troops. Instead of effecting a maneuver to turn from the machine gun fire, which few were likely to have survived, the riders charged straight at the tanks in the hope of squeezing through, and about half of them actually succeeded. The legend sprang originally from the report of an Italian journalist... Two films, Campaign in Poland, 1940, and Battle Squadron Lutzo, 1941, successfully lodged the story in the memory of posterity. The Polish nobility saw themselves as a riding elite more emphatically than any other strand of the European upper classes. The cavalry was not only lost in tradition, it was captive to its noble ethos captive to images of long bygone wars which were still revered for their beauty. Until very recently, the cavalry still claimed to be more than a mere branch of the armed services like the infantry or artillery. It wore the badge of military aristocracy deep into the strata of modernity. Even after it had long since become obsolete as a military unit, it still paraded itself as a monument to another unforgotten world. The idea of the cavalryman survived his real demise in a hail of bullets. Wherever a uniformed man showed up on a horse, whether or not it was in the carnage of mechanized warfare, the age-old drama still played out on the stage, a dramatized conflict like a duel of warring peoples, battles over the scraps of cavalry banners, an echo of pomp and circumstance. The last great cavalry units of the world, the Red Armies, survived an entire decade after the end of the Second World War. It was not until the mid-1950s that their regiments were finally disbanded. Hiroshima was a whole ten years in the past. Stubbs had been in the horse painting business for nearly four decades. As a successful artist, he had accompanied the phenomenal rise of the English racing scene, the Formula One of his century, and at times lived well from it. By the mid-1750s, he had discovered his niche and executed an unprecedented coup. For 18 months, he worked in a barn in Hawkstow, Lincolnshire, like a man possessed dissecting around a dozen horses which he bled to death in order to avoid causing any damage to their bones, tendons or veins. He worked for weeks on some of the carcasses for which he had designed an ingenious hoisting device, seemingly oblivious to the terrible stench and the risk of sepsis. And since he was both anatomist and artist, and both with the same virtuosity, he dissected and sketched ceaselessly, every layer of muscle that he exposed. Eventually, he boiled the skeleton and charted it too, meticulously recording every individual bone. In his barn, George Stubbs excavated the temple of a pagan cult, the anatomy of the horse. Stripping away and exposing layer after layer, he penetrated into the depths of the body, Five tiers of muscles, tendons, and veins were painstakingly recorded in his drawings. Stubbs displayed each of his dead horses with the elegance and grace of an animated young animal, trotting casually like a dancer. From one look at Stubbs's graceful ideal animal, one can clearly see the breed of horse in question, the Arabian-influenced English thoroughbred. <laughs> 
there is one striking way in which Stubbs deviated from precedent. His beautiful horses do not have idealistic vistas unfolding in the background. Stubbs presented his horses in a void. With his The Anatomy of a Horse, Stubbs began to reveal the feature of his painting that would secure him a singular position in the history of art, the isolation of the animal body, free of accessories and window dressing. Stubbs, who painted his horses with such photorealistic precision that each model could be recognized as a distinct individual, which breeders and owners particularly valued, was quietly radical in an abstract approach which was quite ahead of its time. Save for the slightest shading beneath the feet, Stubbs did away with everything that was not part of the stallion, mare or foal. These few paintings of beautiful, shimmering horses took on an iconic quality. Although the gold of these icons was no halo or shimmering background, but a glimmer of light on his subject's brown coat. The most famous of the series is the portrait of the riderless stallion, Whistlejacket, in the Lavard position. It has been described as the most significant horse portrait ever painted. To date, there exists the theory, a rumor fed by Stubbs himself, that it was a half-finished equestrian portrait of George III, in which, for various reasons, the background and the addition of the king by another artist were never completed. In the case of other similarly abstract portraits, such as the Mares and Foals series from the same year as Whistlejacket, 1762, it is more difficult to explain. Perhaps these radically isolated images are something of a secret destination within Stubbs's work. For Stubbs, the fullness of life is only to be found in horses, and all the more so when we abstract this from all distracting worldly references. In Henry Fuseli's most famous painting, The Nightmare, of 1782, the horse also appears as the embodiment of horror. The picture shows a curvaceous sleeping beauty, lightly clothed and half tumbling from the bed, with a demonically grinning incubus crouching on her chest. Presumably this is the Alb, demon, from the German word Albtraum, nightmare. Behind him, an eerily glowing horse head peers through the curtains into the murky midnight room. The phonetic correspondence in English between nightmare and mare, as in a horse, has meant that in the English-speaking world, including North America, the idea of a nightmare is intimately associated with the idea of the horse. Ernest Jones, student and biographer of Freud, included Fuseli's Nightmare as the frontispiece to his 1949 study On the Nightmare and dedicated an entire chapter to the interpretation of the sinister horse's head. He begins by noting that to describe the same etymology to both kinds of mare is a misconception arising from the confusing similarity of the two words and that in fact the second part of Nightmare derives from the Anglo-Saxon word Mara, which was more like an incubus or succubus, that is, an erotic intruder at night. But, as Jones continued, it is possible that within this linguistic confusion lies another, deeper, dormant truth in the realm accessible by psychoanalysts. Philology might sleep calmly on its certainties, but suspicious psychoanalysis lies wide awake. But what if there was something in the mistaken correlation of the sexual demon and the horse? If the two acquaintances really were in fact related, as the English term suggests? Jones is confident that when human beings and animals are put on an equal footing in a dream, there is always one underlying meaning, an incest complex. The folklorists and mythologists of the 19th and 20th centuries have never tired of collating all the local variants of horseman legends, of sacred steeds and devilish nags. The nameless stranger played by Clint Eastwood in Pale Rider, a western from 1985, is a wandering preacher. Whether he had the Bible in his hands or a colt, he was always surrounded by a stony, cool vibe through which blew the icy breeze of death. The pale rider on his pale horse is one who has returned from the other side. Like many westerns, 
Pale Rider is a cinematic ghost story. The burnt-out hero makes a comeback as Revenant. When Revenants make their return on horseback, and indeed many seem to, their mythological origins lie either in the misty climes of the north or in the balmy coves of the Aegean. Their screenplays were originally composed by the anonymous creators of myths, legends and figures of pre-Christian Europe, St. John's Apocalypse and Norse mythology and the broad field of superstition all make up the fictional horse markets where the spirits of the dead come to procure their mounts. The Apocalypse of St. John the Apostle, Revelations chapter 6, 1 to 8, brought us the four horsemen of the Apocalypse. The first, on a white horse, carries a bow, wears a crown, and is called Conquest. Traditionally interpreted as a ruler, he was identified with the victorious returning Christ. The second, on a red horse, carries a great sword and represents war and violence. The third, on a black steed, brandishes a pair of scales in the air as he announces famine. And the fourth, riding a pale horse, brings death by plague, war and wild beasts. He is the pallid rider on an ashen horse, whose colorlessness recalls the pallor of one who is dying. This fourth horseman dominates the cultural imagination of North America, so influenced by Protestant ideology that it finds its way even into the film scripts of Hollywood. Wrapped in the flag of the United States, the coffin of the president rested on a gun carriage drawn by six gray horses. A single standard bearer followed the funeral carriage. What followed next was for most viewers the most puzzling element in the long procession. Led by hand by a soldier in parade uniform, walked a dark brown, riderless horse, restlessly prancing. The animal was fully saddled and carrying a pair of riding boots reversed in the stirrups, as though its rider had been facing backwards before dismounting. As John F. Kennedy had at no point been a cavalryman, he could not be seen as a reference to his military origins. But even if the meaning and origin of the symbol remained obscure to most witnesses of the ceremony on the 25th of November 1963, no one was left untouched by the power of the strange spectacle. The riderless horse with the boots reversed, a nervous, prancing and snorting sculpture, evoked nothing less than death. The caparison horse is a ceremonial element of the American state funeral. Appearing for the first time at the funeral of George Washington in 1799, this symbolic horse then walked behind Abraham Lincoln's coffin in 1865, before later appearing in the funeral processions of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Ronald Reagan. The word caparison, from the French caparison, refers to the ornamental covering worn by a horse, which was typical of medieval tournaments and Baroque funeral horses. Despite the name, the comparison horse of the U.S. military wears only a bridle, saddle, and an elegant black saddle blanket with a white trim. This sobriety makes the backwards-facing boots all the more arresting. By omitting the full cover and the decorative accoutrements and adding just one detail, the boots the ceremony established its distinct formula for pathos, which can barely be outdone in terms of austerity and intensity. Unlike its Baroque predecessors, it does not speak grandiloquently of the transience of earthly things. It gives voice to death itself. And yet the great reverser of all things does not speak. Only the clatter of the horse's hooves breaks the silence. The popular interpretations that promise details of the ritual's historical origins amount to little more than references to figures such as Genghis Khan, Buddha, and certain Indian chiefs who were buried along with their horses. Instead of dispersing the fog that obscures its origins, they make it denser. However, the formula of reversal, for example, of weapons or shields, has belonged since the Middle Ages to the ritual of the princely and military funeral cortege. 
as does the custom of having the coffin of the deceased person followed by his favourite horse. The fidgety horse that followed Kennedy's coffin, constantly prancing about, was called Black Jack. Born in 1947, Black Jack had been in the service of the army since 1953, serving as the military funeral horse in over 1,000 funeral processions, although he was considered uncontrollable and would constantly disturb the solemn tranquility of the occasion. After 20 years in service, he retired in June 1973, and after his death in 1976, he was cremated and interred with full military honours in Fort Myer, Virginia, not far from Arlington Cemetery, where John F. Kennedy is buried. With hindsight, what in the eyes of his military superiors constituted Black Jack's biggest weakness, his stubborn tendency to fidget nervously, came to be seen as his symbolic strength. After all, in countless myths and folk legends of old Europe, a horse starting with fright and snorting is taken as a harbinger of death. <laughs> 